Fire Alarm by Michael Lowey. This is chapter two, and it's all in one part. The opening up of history. In the history of 20th century ideas, Benjamin's theses seem to represent a detour, a mere byway beside the great highways of thought. But whereas the latter are carefully marked out, clearly signposted, and led to duly charted stopping off points, Benjamin's little path goes to an unknown destination. The 1940 theses represent a kind of philosophical manifesto in the form of dialectical images and allegories, rather than abstract syllogisms for the opening up of history. That is, for a conception of the historical process that opens onto a dizzying field of possibilities a vast branching structure of alternatives without, however, falling into the illusion of absolute liberty. The objective conditions are also conditions of possibility. That conception stands explicitly on the ground of the Marxist tradition, historical materialism, which Benjamin wishes to wrench from the bureaucratic conformism that, that threatens it as much as, if not more than, does the enemy. As we have seen, his relation to the Marxian heritage is highly selective and involves the abandonment of, rather than the explicit critique of, or a direct settling of accounts with, all the moments in the works of Marx and Engels that have served as references for the positivistic evolutionary readings of Marxism in terms of irresistible progress, the laws of history and natural necessity. Benjamin's reading stands in direct contradiction to this idea of inevitability, which from the Communist Manifesto onwards haunts certain texts by Marx and Engels. What the bourgeoisie produces above all are its own grave diggers. Its fall and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. Nothing is further from Benjamin's approach than the belief suggested by certain passages in Capital in a historical necessity of a natural kind. The work of Marx and Engels doubtless has unresolved tensions running through it, and between a certain fascination with the natural scientific model and a dialectical critical approach between faith in the organic and quasi-natural maturation of the social process and the strategic vision of revolutionary action that seizes an exceptional moment. These tensions explain the diversity of Marxisms that were to dispute the Marxian heritage after the death of its founders. In the theses of 1940, Benjamin ignores ideas at the former end of the Marxian spectrum and takes his inspiration from the latter. Why does Benjamin prefer to attack social democratic epigonies rather than contest certain of the writings of Marx and Engels themselves, which made those interpretations possible? We may assume that there were several, not necessarily contradictory, reasons for this attitude. A, the conviction that the real Marx lies elsewhere, and the positivist moments are secondary. B, the political option of setting Marx himself against his epigonies, who have in any case diluted or traduced his message. C, the desire, following the example of his masters Lucas and Korch, to state his reading of historical materialism in a positive mode, rather than critically review the writings of the founders. Though no direct criticisms of Marx and Engels are to be found in the theses themselves, they do figure here and there in the associated notes, for example, in the notes on revolution as the locomotive of history, which calls into question through the image the entire vision of progress as a linear, irresistible process. More important is the remark on the productive forces as the chief criterion of progress. This is actually a point of major significance, which occupies a crucial place in the work of the fathers of modern socialism, and which largely fueled the economistic interpretations of the Second International and Stalinist productivism. But the question remains at the level of a programmatic proposal and Benjamin does not go into it more deeply. The recasting of historical materialism in the theses also involves, of course, a selective and heterodox reappropriation of the Marxian themes that seem to him essential to his undertaking. The state as class domination, the class struggle, 
the social revolution, and the utopia of a classless society. Materialism itself, revised by theology, is incorporated into his theoretical system. Benjamin takes his inspiration from texts like the 1844 manuscripts, the historical writings of the revolution of 1848 to 50, or the Paris Commune, and the critique of the Gotha program, all copiously cited and commented on in the Arcades project. The result is a reworking, a critical reformulation of Marxism, integrating messianic, romantic, blankist, libertarian, and Fourier Fourierist splinters into the body of historical materialism. Or rather, it is the fabrication on the basis of the fusion of all these materials, of a new heretical Marxism, radically different from all the orthodox or dissident variants of his time. A messianic Marxism which could not but arouse, as Benjamin, as Benjamin himself had predicted, perplexity and incomprehension, but also and above all a Marxism, Marxism of unpredictability. If history is open, if the new is possible, this is because the future is not known in advance. The future is not the ineluctable result of a given historical evolution the necessary and predictable outcome of the natural laws of social transformation, the inevitable fruit of economic, technical, or scientific progress, or, worse still, the continuation and ever more perfected forms of the same, of what already exists, of actually existing modernity, of the current economic and social structures. What is the meaning today of the dawn of the 21st century, 60 years after Benjamin's death, of this opening up of history. First, on the cognitive level, it throws light on a new horizon for thought, the search for a dialectical rationality which, shattering the smooth mirror of uniform temporality, rejects the pitfalls of scientific uh, prediction of the positivist type and brings within its purview the Klinemann rich in possibilities, the Kairos pregnant with strategic opportunities. Unpredictability is, admittedly, only relative. It seems undeniable that a certain number of 20th century predictions have, more or less, come to pass. There remains, nonetheless, in the course of historical events, an irreducible core of the unexpected that lies beyond the most rigorous calculations of probability. This is not merely a result of the limitations inherent in the methods of the social sciences but arises from the very nature of human praxis. Unlike lunar, lunar eclipses or Halley's Comet, the outcome of the historical action of individuals and social groups remains, to a substantial degree, unpredictable. There is nothing mystical or irrational in this observation. It flows from the very nature of politics as a collective, plural human activity, which though admittedly conditioned by the existing social and economic structures, is capable of exceeding, transforming, or overturning them by creating something new. Whether this irreducible dimension is described as the subjective factor, volunteerism, the freedom of the subject, subject the autonomy of social actors, or the human project, the fact remains that political action defies any attempt to analyze it as a mere function of structures, or even worse, as the outcome of the scientific laws of history, economics, or society. If no one in June 1789 foresaw the fall of the Bastille, or even less, the execution of the king and the proclamation of the Republic, this is not because contemporaries lacked adequate instruments of scientific knowledge, as a particularly dogmatic positivism might claim, but because these events were as innovative historical acts essentially unpredictable. If we take seriously the tragic aspect of Benjamin's vision of history, this power of innovative political action is not necessarily a source of optimism. It may perfectly well lead, as the history of the 20th century abundantly illustrates, to terrifying results. From the political point of view, open history means then taking into account the possibility though not the inevitability of catastrophes on the one hand and great emancipatory movements on the other. This is far from obvious today. Are we not living in a pacified age, infinitely far removed from the years of war and revolution of the first half of the last century? 
Many works on Walter Benjamin published in recent years assert or suggest that, that this fascinating author belongs to a tragic historical conjuncture that is now past and gone. The philosophical problematics that correspond to current social and historical reality are said to be more of the order of the re resolution of conflict by the democratic, rational procedures of communicative action, Habermas, or in terms of the postmodern relativism of language games, Leotard. We have, it is said, a choice between perfecting modernity by discursive rationality or going beyond it into postmodernity post by putting an end to grand narratives. Now, although it is clear that history does not repeat itself, and our age bears little resemblance to the, to the 1930s. It seems difficult to believe that, in the light of the experience of the end of the 20th century, wars, ethnic conflicts, and massacres belong only to a distant past, or that racism, xenophobia, and even fascism no longer represent a danger for democracy. Did these threats of catastrophe which echo past disasters? <clears throat> we should add others, newer ones. For example, the possibility of a major ecological disaster putting the very survival of the human race in danger, a form of destruction wrought by the storm we call progress, which Benjamin, in spite of his critical thinking on the domination exploitation of nature, cannot foresee. Or alternatively, the possibility of new unpredictable forms of barbarism that do not replicate those of the past, which may be produced during the coming century as long as modern societies remain subject to relations of inequality and exclusion. Contrary to what the reassuring discourse of the present doxa claims, Benjamin's fire alarm retains its currency to a striking extent. Catastrophe is possible, if not indeed probable, unless, though formulated in the style of the biblical prophets, Benjamin's pessimistic predictions are conditional. There's a danger of this happening, if, and this means that the worst is not unavoidable. History remains open. It has other revolutionary, emancipatory, and or utopian possibilities to it. Benjamin helps us to give utopia back its negative force by the break with any teleological determinism and any ideal model of society that maintains the illusion of an end to conflict and hence to history. The conception of utopia suggested by the 1940 theses has the advantage of being formulated predominantly in the negative, a classless society without domination. In the strong sense of Herrschaft, a heteronomous power, heteronomous power that imposes its rules and is beyond any democratic control. This revolutionary aspiration is directed not only against the authoritarian wielding of power through the cunning and violence of the governing classes, oligarchies, or elites, but also against the impersonal, abstract, and reified, fetishistic domination of capital, commodities, and bureaucratic apparatuses. Benjamin refers predominantly to the emancipation of the oppressed classes, but his general criticism of oppression and his appeal to see history from the standpoint of the victims, of all victims, give his project a more universal scope. Similarly, his criticisms of the exploitation of nature, in spite of their elusive and incomplete character, break sharply with the positivist, scientist, scientistic, scientistic, productivist culture of the human hegemonic schools of thought on the left. They find a surprising topicality in the aspirations of some of the new internationalist movements against neoliberal globalization and in social ecology's project of reconstructing a harmonious equilibrium between human societies and nature, eminently universal issues in as much as they concern humanity in its entirety. Walter Benjamin was far from being a utopian thinker, Unlike his friend Ernst Bloch, he was preoccupied less with the principle of hope and more with the urgent necessity of organizing pessimism, interested less in the radiant future and more in the imminent dangers looming over humanity. He is not far from a tragic worldview of the kind one finds in the youthful essays of Lucas or in the work of Pascal, 
as analyzed after the fashion of Lucas by Lucien Goldman, the deep sense of an unbridgeable abyss between the authentic values one believes in and empirical reality. However, as we have seen in the preceding pages, a fragile utopian dimension, because it is entirely shot through with romantic melancholy and the tragic sense of defeat, is present in his work. Against the dominant tendency in the historic left, which has often reduced socialism to economic objectives of concern to the industrial working class, itself reduced to its male, white, national, stably employed fraction, Benjamin's thinking enables us to conceive a revolutionary project with a general mission to emancipate. This is what is needed if we are to be able to face up to the ethical and political demands of our time and refire the ambition, which is doubtless excessive, but what use to human action would a measured, moderate, mediocre utopia be of putting an end to the domination of one class over another, one sex over the other, one nation over another, and human beings over nature. This is a universal objective which takes its inspiration from the unfulfilled promise of 1789, liberty, equality, and fraternity, or rather solidarity since sisters are included as much as brothers. These are revolutionary values which contain, as Ernst Bloch emphasized, a utopian excess that goes beyond the narrow, petty limits of bourgeois society. Utopian universality, which is subversive in its aim, following the definition Karl Mannheim gives of the concept of utopia, stands opposed term for term to the ideological pseudo-universality that regards the present status quo as the achieved human universal. So far as a different future is concerned, the current dominant discourse expresses a categorically closed conception of history. According to that discourse, since the fall of actually existing socialism and the triumph of the Western Atlantic system, we can affirm once and for all the end of utopias, the end of any possibility of changing the civilizational paradigm. Our age is the first for a very long time, since the beginning of the 19th century, to have dared quite simply to proclaim the end of history. Francis Fukuyama's famous essay merely dresses up in pseudo-Hegelian language the deeply anchored conviction of the dominant elites regarding the durability of their economic and social system, which is seen not merely as infinitely superior to any other, but as the only one possible, as the last horizon of history, the ultimate definitive destination in the long march of humanity. This does not mean that, for the current hegemonic discourse, scientific, technical, economic, social, and cultural progress is not continuing. On the contrary, it will see some tremendous advances, but it will do so within the framework, now fixed once and for all, of the industrial capitalist economy and the existing so-called liberal democratic system. To sum it up, le progrès dans l'ordre, as Auguste Comte has so well predicted. This problematic finds striking expression in a fine text published some years ago by George Lucas's former disciple, Agnes Heller. She observes that for many centuries, humanity's utopian quest took the form of a sea voyage, of a, chip, of a ship setting sail for an island of contentment. In the 19th century, the image of the train came to predominate, the metaphor of the locomotive advancing at increasing speed towards the radiant future, towards the station utopia, sweeping away all the obstacles in its path. In fact, asserts the Hungarian philosopher, we have to say goodbye to the promised land is an illusion. The journey to, sorry, we have to say goodbye to the idea of a utopia situated in imaginary future or place. The journey to the promised land is an illusion. We have in fact already reached the end of our journey which is the modernity in which we live. The metaphor that corresponds to this historical reality is that of a magnificent, spacious railway station into which we are settled and from which we shall not depart. We must abandon the dangerous myth of an elsewhere and especially of an otherwise. As we have seen, Walter Benjamin also uses the allegory of the train, but in order to invert it dialectically, the train of history is heading for the abyss. Revolution is the interruption of this catastrophe-bound journey. 
In his open conception of history, different outcomes are possible, including revolutionary action, which appears more as a desperate attempt to prevent the worst from happening than as the product of the maturing of objective conditions. Benjamin often refers to the oppressed classes as the subject of emancipatory praxis. Now, in the note on the train, he speaks of the whole of humanity activating the emergency break. This universalist approach, which doubtless stands opposed to the particularist corporatism of a certain political trade unionist ideology, though not necessarily to the decisive role of social classes, enables us to rethink social emancipation and the abolition of domination from the viewpoint of the multiplicity of collective or individual subjects. For an open conception of history, emancipatory revolutionary action is of the order and the last analysis of a kind of wager. The word does not appear anywhere in Benjamin, but it corresponds exactly to the spirit of the 1940 theses. According to Lucien Goldman, who does not seem to have been familiar with Benjamin's writings, the Marxian utopia of an authentic human community is of the order of a Pas Pascalian wager. It is the engagement of individuals or social groups in an action that involves risk, the danger of failure, the hope of success, but to which one commits one's life. Any wager of this type is motivated by trans-individual values, whether these are imminent and secular, as in the Marxist wager on the achievement of the socialist community, or transcendental and sacred, as in Pascal's wager on the existence of God and is not susceptible of scientific proof or factual demonstration. Of course, emancipatory social and historical actors behaving in accordance with this wager take into consideration all the objective conditions and order their praxis as a function of the real contradictions of society, but they know the success of their struggle is not guaranteed. That struggle is inspired by an ethical imperative, a categorical imperative which the young Marx formulated as follows. One must struggle to overthrow all conditions in which man is a debased, enslaved, neglected, and contemptible being. It is this universal moral exigency to fight for the abolition of unjust and inhuman social systems that motivates their commitment, irrespective of the chances of victory and whatever the scientific predictions of the future. This uncertainty, far from leading to passivity or resignation, provides a powerful motivation for greater activity since within the limits laid down by the objective conditions, the future will be what we make of it. It is not, it is not just the future and the present that remain open in the Benjaminian interpretation of historical materialism, but also the past. And this means, first of all, that the historical variant that triumphed was not the only possible one. Against the history written by the victors, the celebration of the fete accompli, the historical one-way streets and the inevitability of the victory of those who triumphed, we must come back to this essential proposition. Each present opens onto a multiplicity of possible futures. In every historical conjuncture, there were alternatives which were not doomed to fail from the outset. The exclusion of women from citizenship in the French Revolution was not unavoidable. The rise to power of a Stalin or a Hitler was not, like the rise of Brex Arturo Bui, irresistible. And the decision to drop the atom bomb on Hiroshima had nothing inevitable about it. We could add many other examples to this list. The opening up of the past means also that the so-called judgments of history have nothing definitive or unchangeable about them. The future may reopen closed historical cases, may rehabilitate misrepresented victims, revive defeated hopes and aspirations, rediscover forgotten battles or battles regarded as utopian, anachronistic, or running against the grain of progress. In this case, the opening up of the past and the opening up of the future are intimately linked. There is no shortage of examples of such a linkage. We have only to think of the rediscovery after 1968 of the heretical thinking of the St. Simonian feminist Claire de Mar, whose tremendously subversive work, Ma Loi d'Avenir, from 1834, had been almost entirely forgotten for a century and a half. I say almost because the book had not escaped the watchful Walter Benjamin, who, in his Arcades project, shows great sympathy for Claire de Mar's anthropological materialism 
and her critiques of patriarchy springing in her or springing to her defense against the sordid attacks of the representatives of the established bourgeoisie. The work of the historian E.P. Thompson on the making of the English working class is another striking manifestation of the reopening of the past. <clears throat> He lays his cards on the table in the preface with a statement that was to serve as emblem and shibboleth for a new school of social history. I am seeking to rescue the poor stockinger, the ludite cropper, the obsolete handloom weaver, the utopian artisan, and even the deluded follower of Joanna Southcott from the enormous condescension of posterity. The ironic quotation marks around utopian and obsolete representing themselves an entire program that implicitly challenges the categories of a dominant historiography, steeped in the ideology of linear, beneficent, inevitable progress. Without a critically idealizing these figures from the past, this emphasis on the human and social significance of their struggle brings out the limitations of the progressist, modernizing visions of history, which conflate the successful with the possible, and end up subscribing willy-nilly to the grand narrative of the vic victors of the Industrial Revolution. Whether we are looking at the past or the future, the opening up of history in Walter Benjamin is inseparable from an ethical, social and political decision to support the victims of oppression and those who fight that oppression. The future of this uncertain fight and the forms it takes will no doubt be inspired or marked by past efforts. They will be nonetheless novel for that and wholly impossible to predict.